Thank you, Anthony. It's um, lovely to be here. Um, quite an honor and, and privilege uh, for me to be here and to be able to address you. Um, so, um, the idea of living a meaningful life seems to be closely related to the idea of living a good life or living well. But philosophical analyses of meaning in life and its relationship to living well are few and far between. Contemporary philosophers seldom address it, though meaning figures importantly in Nietzsche's idea of a good life, along with vitality, in pointed contrast to Plato's ideal of psychic harmony. He ridicules um, Plato's ideal as nothing more than, the, than uh, a good life as being able to get a good night's sleep. So I think any and all of these, meaning, vitality, and psychic harmony, might be considered significant aspects or measures of a quality of a life. And they may be independent, interdependent, both psychologically and outwardly in the objective qualities of acts. I'll argue that they are interdependent in both of these respects. <clears throat> I'll focus on the idea of a life being meaningful, where this is understood as having both a psychic or subjective dimension and a closely related dimension of outward or objective quality. A meaningful life is in this sense both personally rewarding and objectively admirable. The same could be said of a good life or living well, that it is both personally rewarding and objectively admirable. But I will take meaning to be a necessary yet not sufficient condition for a life being good uh, or flourishing. I'll assume that a life that is good or flourishing without qualification is, among other things, a life that is morally admirable, while a life that is meaningful might be admirable in some notable respects without being morally admirable. Nietzsche suggests in Beyond Good and Evil that people in the future will look back with awe and envy at the Napoleonic age as one in which the art of war was so brilliantly and admirably elevated. Oh, to have been part of something so important, he would have us say. If this is not your reaction, uh, and you were ready to concede that Napoleon was brilliantly creative, um, may have experienced much satisfaction in his work, but was not a model citizen, you'll understand why I take meaning to be a necessary but not sufficient condition for living well. So living well is the common ambition of human beings whose circumstances permit ambitions beyond meeting their most basic needs. So inquiry into the role of meaning in life might well have both theoretical and practical significance. It might play a significant role in not just orienting ourselves to how to live well, but guiding social policy, education, and the design of institutions that shape, enable, and constrain our activities. My aim in this lecture is to clarify and develop some important aspects of the view that what makes lives meaningful is, in the words of Susan Wolfe, loving objects worthy of love and engaging them in a positive way. Wolfe develops this view in her 2010 lectures on meaning in life and why it matters, and her account will serve well as a point of departure. I should just say, Susan Wolfe in the, in the North American scene is, is rare in actually having devoted a significant proportion of her career to addressing the topic of meaning in life. So Wolf calls her account the fitting fulfillment view. It identifies three key elements in the meaningfulness of a life. One, subjective attraction to some object. Two, the objective worthiness of, that, of the object. And three, active productive engagement with the object. Meaning arises when subjective attraction meets objective attractiveness, leading to engagement in projects of worth. Uh, writes Wolf, and she does. She says this with approving reference to the works of Bernard Williams. So, if you know, if you know his 
work on uh, projects and the way our projects give us reasons that uh, may compete with the reasons of morality, you'll know some of the background. Um, so she says, philosophical models of human motivation tend to be broadly Humean or Kantian. These models insist that people are exclusively motivated by their perceived self-interest, that is, by a small number of basic self-interested desires, or in the case of Hume or in the case of Kant, um, that they're also motivated by categorical demands of impartial reason, the impartial requirements of morality. Ordinary discourse replicates this dichotomy, Wolf says. Um, yet many of the reasons and motives that move us are ones that engage us in the activities that make our lives worth living. Reasons grounded in the attachments and projects that make our lives meaningful. So that's, that's Wolf's view. So this is a bold claim, and it is both, as a claim about motives, an empirical conjecture about human motivation, and as a claim about justifying reasons, a thesis about practical reason or morality that posits meaning as, and these are her words, a category of value in addition to happiness or self-interest and morality. So in her scheme of things, you accept the Humean, uh, uh, something is right in human Kant. There are these two different competing um, uh, kinds of reasons and morality, uh, that is, sorry, in projects or meaning uh, gives us a third category, a third, a third form or source of motivation. So I shall argue that Wolf's central intuition about meaning in life um, is plausible, uh, uh, but it can be placed on a more secure footing uh, in the spheres of both motivation and value. In the sphere of motivation, it's not a bad philosophical strategy to assemble everyday evidence of the deficiencies of the Humean Kantian divide in the way Wolf does. But positing meaning as a, as a third spring of motivation, in addition to self-interested desire and impartial reason, is only the most philosophically obvious of the motivational theses that might be advanced. It's a philosophically conservative thesis. It's also empirically speculative at a time when motivational psychology offers well-supported models for understanding a variety of phenomena dear to the hearts of moral psychologists. I'll bring the most systematic of these models to bear on the idea of meaning in life, and doing so will offer a more systematic understanding of its subjective aspect. I just think this is an area um, where trying to bridge into uh, what the scientists are saying is potentially very fruitful for philosophy. So in the sphere of value, <clears throat> I'll argue that Wolf's notion of categories of value is not well defined, and that her fitting fulfillment view could be better developed through a eudaimonistic account of living well and related ideas about moral and non-moral virtues and other necessities for living well. Turning to the third component of her view, the idea of productive engagement with worthy objects, my aim is to say more than Wolf does by addressing the acquired attributes that make productive engagement possible. Virtues and the related capabilities and understanding that comprise the personal attributes necessary for living well. I'll bring my reactions to the three components of Wolf's view together in a form of eudaimonism, with gesture, which gestures toward implications in the realms of education and public policy. The practical lesson that Wolf draws from, from her account is that, it, she says, it need not be irrational to choose to spend one's time doing something that neither maximizes one's own good nor is morally best. Um, we might reasonably grant this and wish for more. It's a rather weak claim. We might ask whether there are not some differences between projects or goal orientations that make eudaimonistic ones more conducive to living a good and meaningful life. 
people do the darndest things, writes Wolf. This is an extended quote from her. They race lawnmowers, compete in speed eating contests, sit on flagpoles, watch reality TV. Do these activities merit the investment of time and money that people put into them? Do they contribute to the meaning of these people's lives? There may be something to be said on both sides of these questions. That's Wolf. <clears throat> so I think she's right to avoid the, el the elitism long associated with eudaimonism, but she misses opportunities to give her core idea of meaningful lives more teeth. So now I'll begin with subjective attraction and then consider the other components of, of, her, uh, of her view following this. So my strategy in addressing the subjective attraction aspect of meaning will be to examine Wolf's examples of meaningful and meaningless activity and show that they are readily interpreted in light of the systematic theory of motivation to which I've alluded. The theory is called self-determination theory. I'll outline some of the core ideas, and I'll say SDT for short. I'll outline some of the core ideas of SDT and show how the subjective or psychological side of meaning in life can be fit within the landscape of human motivation as it's currently understood in this theory and in psychology. And I should say, this is a theory, this is the, the most systematic theory in the terrain, if, if you look across the terrain of motivational psychology. It's incorporated um, the, the key insights of two earlier, less systematic theories. So, um, this will obviate the need to posit meaning as a distinct source of motivation and dissolve the Humean Kantian divide. So, I'm not going to take her starting point in philosophy as the right place to start. Um, there's something wrong with it, something needs to be done to alter it, but making it more complicated by adding a third, I'll argue, is, is, not, um, is not the most sensible way to go. Um, so this will also explain, uh, the in invoking of this theory will also help explain how we can be motivated to pursue diverse goods whose value is substantially independent of our self-interest. Goods we may be required by morality to respect or ones that may present themselves as especially worthy of our own concern. The explanation involves the idea that the architecture of human motivation has stable common foundations in the form of dispositions, potentialities, and associated needs, but that it can take on many outward forms. In the right external and personal conditions, people can come to care about and devote themselves to a great variety of specific goods, accepting reasons to think they, that these uh, goods are objectively good. Wolf suggests that, a, that loving another person is a paradigm case of the subjective attachment to an object that can give life meaning. Devotion to philosophy, music, and one's garden are other examples she offers. In at least some of these cases, there is attachment not only to objects, but to goods specific to spheres of practice. Um, so in the case of philosophy, which she discusses briefly, uh, devotion to the goods of truth, soundness of argument, grace and clarity of expression. So she says, I'm struggling with this philosophy paper. Why? Well, because I want to get it right. I want it to read well. I want the arguments to be sound. Those are goods that I regard as having objective value and my engagement in doing philosophy, she says, that it's, mean, that it's meaningful activity um, because she cares about those goods, she's devoted to them, and, and they are genuinely ob objective goods. It's, it's not just that she's imagining they are. And there's some sense uh, in which her activity uh, is um, relating her in a uh, positive way or productive way 
uh, to those goods. Okay? So her examples are largely concerned uh, with the quality of engagement in activities through which such objects and goods are or are not engaged. Meaningful engagement manifests itself in, and these are the words she uses, uh, being gripped, excited, interested, engaged, rather than bored or alienated. The task being experienced as boring, futile, pointless, and the like. The examples of subjectively meaningless activity include Sisyphus, condemned to an eternity of soul-sucking, rock-ruling, the alienated housewife, the conscripted soldier, the assembly line worker. Those are, that's most of her examples, actually. <clears throat> so I think these are plausible examples, but Wolf does not flesh them out apart from a discussion of Richard Taylor's thought experiment in which Sisyphus is injected with a drug that causes him to love stone rolling more than anything else, so that he is not subjectively oppressed, but pursuing his greatest passion. So even in discussing um, Sisyphus reformed, or the happy Sisyphus, her concern is simply to deny that the objective aspect of meaning is present. Her concern is to argue that perpetual rolling of the same stone to no good purpose beyond one's own pleasure is pointless and would not render life objectively meaningful. So I read this passage in, in, the, in her uh, lectures. I thought, well, so one could fill in different details. So, uh, I'll only say a word about this, but, because we're talking about the subjective attachment part, not the objective value, but, so, you could imagine, within the details offered, that Sisyphus is, is um, not just loving this and enjoying it, but that his spirit is freed up by the enjoyment enough that he, and he's clever enough that he figures out how to introduce um, creativity, artistry, into the rolling of this stone. Yes, it's the same stone, up and down the same mountain, gets to the top, it rolls down, he has to do it all over again. But now he's enjoying it, and I think if, if, I think if Nietzsche were thinking about this case, he would have thought of this, right? So, um, maybe there are ways of elevating rock rolling to a high art, right? And, and so maybe there would be qualities of artistry in the rolling. I mean, you might dance as you rolled the rock up. Uh, you might invent new steps. You might do it with astounding uh, grace and artistry. You know, and then she would have to say, oh gosh, okay, if you imagine the case that way, then maybe there would be objective value. And she's not requiring that there be moral objective value, just some objective value to it. Um, that, would be, uh, that would answer that part of it. So all of her examples are like this. They're very, very thinly described. And to read the cases, she the cases the way she wants them to go, you have to read into them. You have to add detail. So what I'm going to say about... Uh, the other three, the alienated housewife and assembly line worker and conscripted soldier, is that, I mean, we can accept them as examples of people whose activity doesn't, is, is not subjectively meaningful to them. But you could read them by adding details that are less obvious where they would go the other way. So, so what I'm going to try to do is tease out the kinds of things we would have to add to make these clearly cases where there's not subjective attachment and subjective satisfaction. But then what I want to say is, when you fill those details in, um, you, you see more important things about the subjective meaningfulness side, which then um, send us in directions she doesn't go. So her, her reference to a housewife's alienation suggests a number of things. That the wife does not wholeheartedly accept the role 
and feels less than fully self-determining in enacting it, that it precludes the fulfillment of her potential in other roles and activities that she might experience as more rewarding, that her life may be dominated by a relationship that is not fully mutually affirming, that she may experience social isolation in making a home and caring for young children. If you've had young children and you were the primary caretaker, you'd understand that yes, indeed, that can be quite socially isolating, um, can be. Um, or again, um, that the combination of her circumstances and personal attributes leaves her unable to engage the activities of housework in ways that make it rewarding. These might include deficiencies of self-determination in how she does in how she does the work. Maybe her husband leaves her honey-do lists. I don't know if you have that expression here. We do in the States. Honey, do this for me. Maybe her husband leaves a list of all the things she has to do and, and uh, harps on the way she must do them to be doing them competently, leaving no room for her own judgment even in how she does them, let alone what she does. Um, so, um, so there might be deficiencies of self-determination in how she does the work, deficiencies of resources or imagination <clears throat> or skills or deficiencies of opportunity to exercise imagination and acquire salient capabilities. She may have no gift for ironing, right? uh, no gift for ironing that she can enjoy. I've been waiting for years to get that expression into a talk. I had a German house guest a few years ago, and I was the one in my family who did the ironing. He saw me doing this. He was a medical student. He says, ha, me, I have no gift for ironing. Right, so uh, this became a family joke. But in fact, I, I sort of enjoy ironing, as long as, I, as long as I'm not forced to do more of it than I'm enjoying. Uh, <laughs> So, so, I mean, many aspects of housework, if you had the scope to uh, do them in ways where you used your own judgment, where it wasn't socially isolating and so on, could be enjoyable. So we have to imagine an oppressed housewife. So these are the kinds of things that could make it truly oppressive and rob it of meaning, right? And there's a final possibility. I mean, maybe this life is just all wrong for her. It's just not a good fit. It's just for a whole variety of reasons. So similar things might be said of the conscripted soldier and assembly line worker. Conscription implies a lack of autonomy or self-determination. And so does the pace of assembly line work, right? You're, uh, you have very little room for any movements that aren't prescribed, right? Let alone thoughts about how you're doing what you're doing. Um, so, uh, very little experience of self-determination in what you're doing moment by moment in that. Both soldiering and assembly line work involve a narrowing of activities that preclude the fulfillment of, of potential, some range of potentials. Um, and also uh, involves some frustration of social needs. The pace and nature of assembly line work precludes meaningful social exchanges. And the experiences of killing and losing comrades in war uh, scarcely requires comment as contrary to what we would wish for in the sphere of social relations. So these features of Wolf's examples are these features we would have to fill in for them to be clearly uh, obviously cases that lack subjective attachment and satisfaction, um, these features are the ones I think it would be natural to fill in. Uh, and these features all play central roles in, in the psychology of motivation, in, in self-determination theory in particular. So um, self-determination theory posits three basic universal psychological needs for autonomy, competence, and mutually affirming relationships linked to the fulfillment of human intellectual, productive, and social potentialities. I should say, by the way, for a number of years, as this theory had identified itself as a form of eudaimonistic psychology, their position was that these three basic psychological needs were closely linked 
to the fulfillment of human potentials, but they didn't have a way to articulate the matchup. So what I've just said about the being linked to the fulfillment of human intellectual, productive, and social potentialities, that's actually um, a refinement of the theory which I, which I worked out in collaboration with them. So the theory holds on the basis of hundreds of confirming studies that no one experiences their life as satisfying or going well unless all three of these basic needs are met. These needs are only satisfied when the related forms of potentiality are adequately fulfilled. And, and I'm underscoring those words, right? Needs satisfied, potent, you know, p potentialities fulfilled. In Wolf's account, she uses the word satisfaction a lot, but in ways that um, seem confused to me. So anyway, um, so these needs are only satisfied when the related forms of potentiality are adequately fulfilled, and it is when such satisfaction and fulfillment are present that research subjects in these hundreds of studies um, report and exhibit absence of psychic conflict, vitality or energy and persistence in activities, and a sense of meaning or purpose. So I hope you heard there the three uh, aspects or measures uh, suggested in the history of philosophy uh, in connection um, with living well. So this is an interesting point of convergence. Uh, a psychological theory uh, that has to use measures in uh, determining whether people are experiencing well-being and exhibiting well-being. And in some of their studies, these were the three, these were three measures that they picked. So the theory is grounded in an organismic perspective, according to which human beings have natural dispositions to act, explore, learn, form relationships, and organize and integrate themselves as coherent, purposeful agents who have coherent values and goals and act for reasons. Action and thought arising from these basic dispositions is referred to in the theory as intrinsically motivated. You don't need to invoke desires or uh, rational thought processes to explain them. They're just natural propensities. <clears throat> A variety of other forms of motivation arise from our socialization and social position, ranging from the more or less coerced to interjected, where an internalized perception of threat is motivating, intrinsic, this is the second use of the word intrinsic, where the value of a goal is understood and accepted by the agent, and fully integrated into the agent's schema value. So, that's a, a sort of sequence of, of more autonomous uh, forms of motivation. And it turns out that the way people engage activities looks very different across that different scale. And the quality of engagement and, uh, is higher at the high end with this fully integrated motivation. Um, you get reports of and more observable evidence of psychic harmony and a sense of meaning and vitality or energy and persistence of engagement the higher you get on that scale. <clears throat> okay. So the theory regards socialization as successful when internalization of values and norms yields self-regulation or autonomous motivation. And it argues that human interactions and teaching that support, and this is a quote, the satisfaction of the basic psych psychological needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness is necessary for effective internalization and for psychological growth, integrity, and well-being. Effective internalization supports the psychic integration of values or identified regulation, self-regulation, in which the individuals understand and accept the real importance of something for themselves, 
or have identified with its value for themselves. The autonomy supportive contextual factors identified as favorable to this identified regulation include the offering of a rationale that is meaningful to the person, respectful acknowledgement of the person's inclinations and right to choose, and a manner of offering the rationale and acknowledgement that minimizes pressure and conveys choice. That's a quote from a 1994 uh, paper of theirs. So wholehearted or full acceptance of an integrated system of values as one's own is quite possible on this view, provided it has been compatible with the agent's basic psych psychological needs being met. To recognize the formative significance of these needs is not to see all action as directed toward the satisfaction of those needs, it should be emphasized. The conditions of value acquisition do not preclude acts of self-sacrifice in the future. Right, so the theory is not reductive in that sense. It says there are these basic needs, these basic uh, dispositions that you start from, needs linked to these basic form potentialities. But it's not reductive. It doesn't say that once you build up a system of values and goals and so on and integrate them, it doesn't say that these other things you value, that it's somehow you're still just acting in pursuit of self-interest. Right, so, I mean, there are views that begin from some basic motives and then say all you ever get is action that, uh, that aim at the fulfillment of those basic things. Right, so you could have a version of Hume, right, that wasn't reductive in that sense, but it is reductive in Hume. So this is not reductive. This is a theory of how people can acquire uh, value orientations and goals where they really are uh, aiming at some good external to themselves and to the point of um, all manner of self-sacrifice. Right? So this is a theory that gets something like what Wolf wants. Yes, we can be genuinely motivated to pursue moral goods. We can be genuinely motivated to pursue non-moral goods and those can be extremely important to us and the fixed points around which we orient our lives. So, is meaning in life a psychological need? Um, meaning requires, Wolf says, that the things one loves doing must be good in some independent way. Why should this be some, this is still her, why should this be something that matters to us? If having this in one's life answers a human need, what human need is it? Yeah, I have an answer to that, right? So she, she suggests in response that we have a need to see our lives as valuable from an independent point of view and that this is associated with or arises from our social needs. Well, self-determination theory could endorse this while taking the position that subjective meaning is an aspect and correlate of an underlying human disposition and need to act and organize ourselves so as to be intelligible to ourselves. Meaning can be seen from this perspective as closely related to being able to make sense of what we're doing or having a sense of purpose consistent with the observable qualities of our, of our engagement with activities. I add this clause about consistency because our beliefs about our priorities and purposes might be belied by the defects of our engagement. Second question. Uh, so we might ask similarly whether vitality and psychic harmony are also psychological needs. So meaning vitality and psychic harmony seem in fact to be interdependent and linked to each other through the three basic psychological needs. An absence of any of these aspects of well-being may be attributable to any of the three psychological needs not being met. So the goal may not be autonomously pursued, yielding psychic conflict, um, dysfunctional engagement, and lack of purpose or meaning. 
or again, a lack of efficacy or perceived competence may be related to futility, pointlessness, an experience of conflict in pursuing the activity, and so on. Um, if you think your way back and forth through them, you, you'll see many ways in which they could be interrelated. So the relationship between need satisfaction and quality of engagement will also predictably result in the outward qualities of the activity being diminished when the subjective qualities of the experience are poor. So again, remember the scale of forms of motivation that I talked about. Um, they yield different qualities of engagement with the activities. So um, there's going to be a connection between the needs being fulfilled and the quality of the experience and the quality of the outward performance. So there are ways of getting thing, people to do things and many of our institutions are designed in ways to get people to do things. But where the motivation is interjected, you try to scare the daylights out of people and by you know, giving them no job security. And you think you'll get better performance out of them. And the truth is, they're more worried. There's some sense in, in which maybe they're more highly motivated. They have more motivation but it's not a very highly functional form of motivation. They tend to make more mistakes. Um, you don't get the best out of them. They'll only do what you're requiring them to do, and a variety of problems. So, so now I'll turn to objective worthiness. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be schematic. So is meaning a category of value in addition to happiness or self-interest? and morality, as Wolf suggests. The idea of categories of value strikes me as obscure. And after some discussion of possible theories of, of objective value, Wolf adopts a very tolerant stance toward the range of projects that might count as objectively valuable, lawnmower racing, speed eating, and all that. So there are points in the discussion where she asserts plausibly that we have stronger reason to engage in meaningful activities than to indulge in mere pleasure. Skip, so an example she gives, skipping office hours to attend a lecture by a philosopher is one thing. Uh, I hope none of you are skipping your office hours right now. And skipping office hours to soak in a hot bath, quite another. She refers to shallow hedonism as not conferring meaning on life. But curiously, from my point of view, she never contrasts such hedonism explicitly with eudaimonism. There are no references to the idea of fulfilling uh, potentialities or potential well, an idea central to eudaimonism. So making the contrast explicit would point inquiry about devotion to things of objective value in a more promising direction. So here's a, here's a shot at an alternative uh, conception of categories of value, which I think would be more helpful. Um, so uh, we could distinguish intrinsic, non-instrumental, and instrumental value. That, it, that at least is, is a, um, I think, a well-formed uh, set of categories. So think of intrinsic value as um, lodging in sentient beings, uh, so beings that can have some conception of their own uh, well-being. Uh, so sentient beings, their flourishing um, and constituent elements of such flourishing such as their virtues. Um, think of non-instrumentally valuable things as things valued for themselves by sentient beings. So for instance, uh, activities, uh, objects they value. So the activities notably in which flourishing is expressed and objects of attachment that are foci of such activities. And then think of instrumental value as, uh, on, as things that are instrumentally valuable are ones that are only indirectly valuable owing to a relationship uh, to uh, one or both of the first two forms of value. I guess ultimately they have to be connected to both. So the ways activities are good for human beings 
uh, would be by direct participation in them, right? Um, if you care about them, if they have this non-instrumental value for you, allowing them uh, so that they would uh, fulfill potentialities in admirable activity and accomplishments. Um, things instrumentally valuable might contribute less directly uh, to uh, people's well-being by making uh, participation in, in those uh, non-instrumentally valuable activities uh, possible or more likely. Right? So, so here's an observation. I mean, activities vary in the degree to which they instrumentally and non-instrumentally uh, have value. So there are practices which do a lot to enable people to, uh, to engage in activities that they find inherently valuable. Um, there are others that don't. So uh, you might say, um, pole sitting or, uh, or fast eating contests, people may genuinely enjoy them. Um, they're, they're not as conspicuously uh, contributory towards other people's well-being as other activities we can think of that many people could find very rewarding if, if the institutional settings for them made, uh, uh, allowed them to be um, uh, uh, inherently rewarding. So I think this would make some discriminations possible on the level of policy and institutional design without elitism. There are better and worse practices and in institutions, better and worse with respect to their direct and indirect contributions to human flourishing. So I think um, self-determination theory has been developed partly with the idea of having, of, of getting a critical edge on institutional design. So there's a lot more, there's more detail I could fill in, in in discussion about that. So the larger theoretical task this implies is to develop an account of what's naturally good for human beings that is cautious about the range of good lives left open by the constraints of our life form and psychology an account of conduciveness to human well-being might revolve around the satisfaction of basic universal needs of human nature or the idea of Aristotelian necessities for living well. I almost was almost going to get through this talk without ever mentioning Aristotle, but the idea of an Aristotelian necessity is uh, the idea of some prerequisite for fulfilling um, some human good some prerequisite for, for living well. So there might be ones that are internal to human beings and there might be ones that are external in the circumstances in which people act. So now um, that's all I can say about um, objective value. So productive engagement. <clears throat> Wolf treats meaningfulness as arising from positively engaging with a worthy object of love. So her view endorses the importance of a convergence between subjective and objective aspects of living well, but she has little to say about the circumstances of convergence or the prerequisites of meaningful engagement with worthy objects of attachment, despite the fact that she often reverts to images of meaningless activity that are lacking in autonomy or without meaningful experience of competence in exercising one's human potential. What she says about the nature of productive engagement is limited to a list of the right kind of relationships to the good. To create it, promote it, honor it, or more generally, to actively affirm it in some other way. She cites with approval Stephen Darwall's formulation, and his account is not an account of meaning, but of well-being, um, where his formulation suggests one must see not only the object of value as valuable, but also one's activity in relation to it as valuable. Well-being is understood in his account to revolve around the experience of connecting with something of worth in a way that enables the direct appreciation, appreciation of the value of one's activity. So you have to not only value the object you're pursuing, you have to perceive the uh, value of one's activity. And so it, 
I find it hard to imagine how you could perceive the value of, of your activity in relating to the object without perceiving your activity as um, being in some way helpful or competent or effective, right? So, I mean, I, Darwell's point seems right, but it just seems to entail some notion of competence or capability to succeed in the activity through which one relates to the object, as well as understanding and the right kind of regard exhibited in virtues of respect, loyalty, piety, or forms of regard that animate non-moral virtues. So capabilities, understanding, and virtues are goods pertaining to the fulfillment of social, productive, and intellectual potential. Their cultivation is an obvious basis for enabling people to engage in the activity without which you wouldn't experience meaning on this view. Uh, uh, so, and I think their cultivation is an, uh, the cultivation of these uh, capabilities, understanding virtues, all of which would come into play in the regard for the objects the ability to engage them uh, in a productive way. I think the cultivation of them is an obvious target for education uh, and in some respects broader social policy if the goal is to f facilitate the living of meaningful and good lives. So um, I have a little bit of time left. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to offer a concluding section <laughs> where I try to say a little bit to bring uh, the work of the last, uh, well, the work of all three sections together. So think of this as a very quick sketch of uh, a kind of empirically informed eudaimonism with application to how we educate people. So agency can be seen as involving the interplay of epistemic, evaluative, and capability components. We bring desires and values, or states of character, together with beliefs and understanding using mental capabilities that yield decisions that are put into action using further capabilities. Being limited and imperfect in each of these components or dimensions of agency, it is more or less essential to surviving and flourishing that we are educated in ways that develop all three and cultivate capacities of self-assessment through which we can critically examine and take responsibility for the state of all three of these, uh, of these attributes of ourselves. In diverse spheres of endeavor, we become free to do and be things we could not do or be without acquiring both the domain-specific capabilities and understanding and the related virtues of self-directed commitment to the goods and standards governing those spheres. So Aristotelian necessities for living well pertain to these attributes of persons, but also the circumstances of their lives. When these necessities are all present and aligned, the fulfillment of human social, intellectual, and productive potentials in admirable activity is accompanied by satisfaction of related social autonomy and competence needs. Self-determination theory research suggests that the satisfaction of these needs is associated with sustained happiness over the course of time. The theories mined Aristotle's texts even before I started collaborating with them. So one of the things they looked at was, well, what about, what about goal orientations that are eudaimonistic, uh, focused on things of inherent value, versus goal orientations focused on extrinsic things? Uh, money, um, fame, uh, things like that, and looks, where those things, as Aristotle says, sort of depend on the approval, the approbation of others. Right? Um, and what they found is uh, those extrinsic goal orientations, um, especially uh, rating 
wealth as a very important life goal, those are predictive of people being less happy. Uh, having the eudaimonistic goal orientations are predictive of people being more happy. So, um, uh, it's very easy to see significance of this kind of empirically informed eudaimonism for social policy. In the United States, we've been several decades now following policies that have favored the creation of more millionaires. We sort of imagine people will be happier if we have more millionaires. Um, there's a vast body of research showing that this isn't true. And in fact, having policies that let the gap grow between rich and poor uh, has all sorts of bad effects. For one thing, um, seeing other people doing much better materially causes um, a greater focus in, in most of us on those things that other people have and we lack. So, in a world where the inequalities are more compressed, it's, it's psychologically uh, a more tenable and likely that people will focus on things that are actually inherently rewarding, and everyone will be happier. That's a very direct implication of this, of this view for social policy. So having begun from my tripartite conception of agency as involving epistemic, evaluative, and capability components, we could specify three related categories of essential goods without which no one lives well. These goods are associated with the three broad kinds of potentialities that must be fulfilled reasonably well over the course of a life for it to conceivably qualify as successful or flourishing. The kinds of potentialities in question are intellectual, social, and productive. And by productive, I mean just broadly productive of, of effects in the world. Their respective goods are truth, understanding, knowledge, good judgment, and self-governance in accordance with good judgment. Relationships of mutual goodwill in which virtues of character are displayed and goods associated with diverse forms of competence or excellence in arts of performance, production, and other forms of endeavor. I'll just interject here. And Richard Peters was referred to in, in, in the previous talk. And I mean, <clears throat> Peters had a view of the nature of education according to which it is inherently sort of initiation into the forms of knowledge. So, I give that view a lot of credit, but, uh, but here I'm implicitly broadening it. Uh, what Peters wanted to see was for people to be led into the nature of these very important human endeavors. So, but the focus was, was on endeavors or practices of inquiry. So, what I've just said here in this list uh, implies People can find meaning and opportunities to live well in a broader set of things that we actually do in schools beyond initiating people into forms of knowledge. There are, there's a world of valuable human practices. Um, I think this theory gives us starting points for sorting those into the ones valuable enough to want to initiate people into in schools. But the idea of initiation is you at least have the opportunity um, to become a practitioner in some way in this practice where you're becoming attached to important goods and learning, uh, uh, acquiring the attributes you would need to meaningfully relate to them. Okay. So <clears throat> these essential goods are not simply enabling conditions for living well, but constitutive elements of living well. And on this form of eudaimonism, they're sufficient for living well. We can abandon the elitism historically associated with eudaimonism, but preserve the core eudaimonistic idea that living well involves admirable, self-directed fulfillment of potentialities in human endeavors with, occupied with goods that are valued for their own sake and not just instrumentally. The promotion of forms of development conducive to living well will consequently be understood to concern the acquisition of understanding, capabilities, and virtues of character and intellect. 
Developmental and epistemic dependence are fundamental, limiting aspects of the human condition that would be recognized, that should be recognized in public policy as no less central to the purposes of a cooperative society than the perils of lacking system for adjudicating conflict or regulating economic activity. This is a reference to what we take as a starting point for political theory. And what's the, what is, what's the nature of the human condition that makes it desirable to be a member of a cooperative society? Right? Is it that there'll be unending conflict if we don't adjudicate conflict collectively? Is it that, well, we're producing stuff and it needs to be distributed, and so we want, we want, to, uh, we want to provide security for people engaging in productive activities, but also divide it in a, in a way that's fair? Those are typical starting points. I'm suggesting, no, uh, lacking understanding of the world and lacking virtues and lacking capabilities are fundamental to the human condition. <laughs> These are fundamental limitations that get in the way, inherently in the way of living well. Right? And so we can, you know, why not think of those as also uh, objects from, from the starting point in thinking about um, political, why we have organized societies, what the goals, fundamental goals of social policy should be, why not also start there? Those things are necessary for living well. We would surely all say in the abstract, yes, what we want is to live well. These are the things we need. Right. <clears throat> okay. So flourishing pertains to activity and the activity through which virtues, capabilities, and understanding are acquired and expressed are shaped by the norms and structures of a society's practices, institutions, and arrangements. It is through the activities so shaped that perception, understanding, desire, attachment to goods, and capabilities develop, all in connection with acquiring vocabularies of the good, forming identities, and finding meaning and direction in life. All institutions may be considered at least potentially educational in these respects and as mediating access to essential goods. Part of the defining function, I want to say, of educational institutions would be to promote forms of development conducive to living well in circumstances conducive to achieving the essential goods noted above. Education that aims to enable people to live well should treat all three of the broad categories of potential as important and help students become good at a variety of things, including relating to others in mutually affirming ways and thinking through what is important to them and how to manage their lives prudently. Focusing on the fulfillment of potentials that would enable students to satisfy their basic psychological needs in this way would supply the most essential internal elements for living well. Education initiates learners into domains whose goods are possible objects of attachment. Such goods would include the beauty and power of an eloquent and insightful formulation of an idea, artistry in diverse domains of performance, qualities of craftsmanship, ingenuity of design, and the like. An introduction to these goods expands a student's understanding of value and opportunities for self-directed activity while offering resources and standards for critical thinking and judgment. Finding the activities of one's life meaningful is an essential aspect of living well, and learning should offer opportunities to live well in part by expanding the range of goods that might lend meaning to a life and doing so in conjunction with nurturing capabilities and understanding through which learners can relate to those goods in significant and productive ways. Thank you.